to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about language families and reconstructing proto-languages. But first, we're excited to announce that the Lingcom grants have been granted and we have amazing winners that are listed in the show notes page or on the website lingcom.org. So you can stay tuned for further news from our four grantees. As the projects start coming out, we'll be telling you about them as well. Speaking of things that are out and in the world, I'm very excited that PM Freestone's Crown of Smoke, which is the conclusion to the Shadow Scent duology, is now available. The UK edition is available worldwide. I created the Aram Tescan language for those books, and we talked about that for book one in our episode 37 about language and smell, because it's set in a world where scent is really evocative and powerful. So if you want to know how that book series ends, you can get book two now. This month's Patreon bonus episode is about linguistics with kids. So books and activities and observations that you can do with kids to learn more about how they're learning language or to incite a joy of language with kids. You can get this as one of 40 bonus episodes that we have available at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. So we have over 40 bonus episodes. So if you've listened to all of the main Lingthusiasm episodes and you're like, oh no, I wish there were more Lingthusiasm, good news, you can support the show and listen to so many bonus episodes that are right there waiting for you. talking about history and getting kids excited about linguistics, can we go back into really ancient history and talk about how I got into linguistics? Oh my gosh, yes. (laughs) So I've told part of this story before. Uh, I first encountered linguistics when I was around 12 or 13, Mm -hmm. and I happened across a pop linguistics book on a bookshelf. Ah, so this was started by a specific book. How interesting. This is started by a specific book that I still have, and I came across this bookshelf, and I just kind of picked it up because I looked like pop science, and I knew I liked pop science. And then I got about halfway through it, and I was reading it, and I was like, this is so cool. This is the coolest thing. This book is never leaving my possession again. Uh, fortunately, it belonged to my grandparents, and they were willing to let me steal it. <laughs> so <laughs> Nice of them. One of the things that really sparked my imagination when I was reading this pop linguistics book was that it had this chapter about proto-world. <laughs> Proto world. I feel like you kind of have to say it like that. Proto world. Okay, let me try. It was about proto world. Exactly. So, and this is this like tremendously exciting (laughs) idea that like maybe we could figure out what the oldest language in the world sounds like. Okay. And to me at the time, this seemed like incredibly exciting. Like, what Mm. an ambitious task. All of the 7,000 languages in the world, you could figure out what they might have in common. And unfortunately, (laughs) as I discovered... (laughs) I don't want to disappoint 13-year-old Gretchen, but that's a a bit of a tall order. Uh, Unfortunately, as I learned more about linguistics, I also learned that proto-world is not a thing. But having said that, the ability to take what we know about languages now and work backwards is is definitely a thing that's the field of historical linguistics. Right. And what we can do is we can go back at this sort of time depth of a few thousand years, you know, 2,000 years to maybe 5,000 years, and figure out what languages had in common there and figure out some larger language families. Unfortunately, languages (laughs) or you know, fortunately, very interestingly, language is probably some hundreds of thousands of years old, and there's just no way of going back to that extreme time depth. But for this couple thousand years that we can do, it's super interesting. And I think it's worth explaining why things get too squishy to go back to proto-world by looking at kind of how we start doing historical linguistics and why you can only go back so far. Yeah, exactly. So I think the language that a lot of people think of when we think about reconstructing historical languages is this language called Proto-Indo-European. And, you know, you don't have to say Proto-Indo-European, because this one's pretty solid. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
And this is the <laughs> reconstructed ancestor language of many of the languages that are spoken in Europe and the Indian subcontinent. Not all of them, there are some that aren't related to this, uh, like Basque and uh, Hungarian, but most of the languages spoken in Europe and a large number of languages spoken in India all have this relationship. And I think it's not super surprising to people that languages are related. Like, you know, as an English speaker, if you hear German or Dutch, you're like, I can recognize some of those words. They're easy. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it really takes, you know, a whole, like, reconstructing proto-language to hear, like, the English word apple and the German word apple and be like, hmm, I wonder if there's a connection there. Whoa, they're related. <laughs> or even the better of the Dutch word, which is literally also apple, but spelled differently. Like, I don't think that's rocket science. What I think is impressive, though, and where historical linguistics really came into its own is looking at similarities, but also differences and figuring out how those differences were systematic. And so you can work back in time. So if you think about, you know, as languages go on, the sounds change. So if you put that in reverse, you can kind of reverse those sound changes to figure out what an earlier version of the language might have sounded like. Right. And so you can kind of make fun of this, like, apple, apple example. But there are, you know, connections that are a little bit less intuitive. So, you know, one of my favorite connections is you get these sort of uh, <laughs> very large and elaborate tables, <laughs> which we cannot convey tables in an audio podcast form. Um, <laughs> Not pleasantly, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> they go through and look at particular words. So you have a word like pater in Latin and father in English and pitar in Sanskrit and vater in German. And you can look at them and be like, huh, all of those languages except for English have that T in the middle. And English has a th sound, which isn't that different from a T. Um, and you have like padre in Spanish. Be like, ah, D, that's not that different from a T. So maybe there was an ancestor language that had a word like this for father that also had a T in the middle. Or if you look at and you have, okay, pater from Latin with a P and Sanskrit both have a P and German has a V and English has an F, you can be like, okay, well, we have two Ps, well, several, several Ps and a couple, you know, Fs and Vs. Maybe there was one of these, especially the P because like Latin and Sanskrit are spoken pretty far apart and like German and English spoken pretty close together, just geographically. So mm -hmm. maybe the ancestor language had a P there as well. You can kind of do that comparison at this very, very nitty gritty level for a whole bunch of individual words and figure out which sounds change. And again, if you see P changing to F, from Latin to English in father, you should also see P changing to F in other words. So like the Latin word pes, pedes, meaning foot, is cognate with foot, because again, you have that, there's that P to F change. And well, German is fuss, which isn't a V. So again, you have to account for this. But like, you can kind of go through and make these very elaborate tables with cross comparisons. My favorite historical sound change comparison because uh, I think it's always good to have a favorite, mm -hmm. is the if you look across a lot of languages that are related to Latin, they have a curt sound where the German languages, which kind of branched off at a slightly different time and in a slightly different way, have a hurt sound, which means that the word canine, which is mm -hmm. the Latin for dog, and the word hound are actually historically related, and that curt hurt is one example of the change. Oh, yeah, because they, they both have this N afterwards. Yeah, there are other changes that happen as well. And then heart and cordial or cordis, which is where a lot of like our medical words around heart, coronary come from. That's that Latin K again. My favorite example with English heart, which is again, uh, there's your H. My favorite example of the specific K to mm -hmm. H change is in cornucopia versus horn of plenty. It's right there. So that cornu at the beginning of cornucopia, that's a horn. And it's the same. And the orn part, corn and horn, you really see a lot of similarities because the rest of the sounds in those words haven't changed as much. And the nice thing about cornucopia is that we borrowed copious from Latin to mean a lot. And because it wasn't just a word that stayed in English and had the systematic sound change, we didn't borrow it as hopious. Uh, we just borrowed it with the Latin sound. So that's the difference between words that are borrowed and words that are related. Yeah. And like the neat thing about doing this sort of comparative reconstruction is that you need to figure out, okay, first of all, 
And what do we know about the history of this word? Because the word copious in English isn't going to give us evidence for what was going on in the ancestor language of the Germanic languages, because we know that it was borrowed from Latin much more recently. So first of all, figuring out where all these words came from, and then doing the comparison only with that bit of core vocabulary that did have all of the sound change happens to it. But the fun thing is that as an English speaker, because we've borrowed so many words from other European languages at various times, is that we can often see these sound changes happen even within mm. English, even if you don't speak Latin, you can be like, oh, I know the word cornucopia. <laughs> so you can see them happen within English as well, because we've borrowed words at different time depths. One thing I'm always blown away with, with historical linguistics doing this comparison and then working backwards to reconstruct an older language is just how much, how many words it requires, how much knowledge of which words are borrowing and which words are original to the language. For every sound rule, there's always these like sub rule exceptions because in front of some verb, something doesn't happen. And it's this meticulous work. And as computers have become more advanced, the scale of the work has expanded so much because you can crunch more data. You know, there's, there's very large spreadsheets and tables that happen to build these reconstructions. But even before that, people could go so far back to reconstruct what they think words were like before written records, because writing is actually a relatively new invention, especially writing of sounds and not just images for words. Yeah, writing is so new. <laughs> And yeah. it's so it's so interesting to look back at this part before written records exists. And mm -hmm. that this is why people call them proto-languages, and any language that's preceded by a proto is something that's been reconstructed. So sometimes you get, you know, old English, we have records of that, we have books about it. But if it's a proto-language, it's specifically called that because we don't have any sort of written records, and it's been figured out in that sort of way. And I think what I really love about historical linguistics is the way that it pays attention, and the people who do it pay such close attention to what's attested and what's reconstructed and the sources of their information. And so there's this convention in historical linguistics to write an asterisk before proto-words. And this kind of confused me coming from the rest of linguistics, because in the rest of linguistics, you put an asterisk before a word or sentence that's not grammatical. Or like in my instant message chat, where I frequently have to use an asterisk because I misspelt a word and need to correct it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, there's that too. But I think that is a bit later of a usage than the uh, linguistic mm. sense. So, but normally in, in most of linguistics, an asterisk is used for, you know, this is, this is ungrammatical. This is like horn plenty of or something like that, which you wouldn't say those words in that order. But historical linguists use that asterisk as a reminder to themselves to kind of be humble about it. Like, it's not that it's ungrammatical. It's that it's unattested. Like, this one, this one isn't real in the same sort of way as like, okay, this is ungrammatical. It's negative evidence. This one isn't kind of real, except for the historical linguists, it's, We've put in a whole bunch of effort and we've had all these theoretical debates and we've come up with like our best effort possible with a lot of <laughs> sweat and tears to figure out this thing that we still want to acknowledge is not real. So the asterisk there is a really sort of intellectual humility. And you begin to see why Proto World would be such a challenge because by the time you get to Proto Indo European, which was probably spoken 4,000 years BCE, so, you know, you're looking at five to 6,000 years ago for Proto-Indo-European. You are making a lot of guesses to get to that point. And then if you try and compare it to any other Proto-language that's been reconstructed, you're now making guesses out of two guesses. Right. Which becomes very slippery. <laughs> And it's kind of like, you know, if you have one number that's fairly uncertain, that's got a margin of error, you know, plus or minus 5%, and you have another number that also has a margin of error, plus or minus 5%, and then you multiply them together, you suddenly have a number that has an error of, I think it's plus or minus 25%, because I think you also multiply the margins of errors. Don't quote me on the statistics, but the point is you get a worse number. <laughs> Uh, a less a less precise number that has a greater margin of error. And the same thing happens when you try to do that. And, you know, there are some attempts to say, okay, well, you know, even if we can't do proto-world, maybe we can find an ancestor language of proto-Indo-European that is, you know, spoken in a slightly larger area. But even that is still very speculative because of the time depth involved. So unless we discover some way that spoken and signed languages left 
fossils or we invent time travel, neither of which feel particularly plausible. Uh, we're stuck with the- I always say this is the first thing that I'm going to do <laughs> whenever I get my hands on a time machine, is I'm going to go back and retrace some language families, and people just don't seem to understand why this is such an important idea. It's so compelling. <laughs> I would fund the heck out of that time travel research. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I need to write a grant. Um, so it's still really neat. You know, if you know a couple of Indo-European languages, you can use it to make nifty connections. I definitely managed to, like, kind of figure out some various, like, Dutch vocabulary from my knowledge of English and, and German. I was able to be like, ooh, I can probably triangulate on what this word means because I know what the, the sound changes have been. And that's really satisfying. But I also think that when we talk about historical linguistics and comparative reconstruction, it's easy to get sort of down the Indo-European rabbit hole because it's so satisfying to do this with languages where you already know potentially more than one of them, or at least you have a bunch of borrowed cognate vocabulary to work with and to see these connections between languages that you're maybe more familiar with. But there's a whole bunch of comparative reconstruction that's also happened in language families in the rest of the world as well. Yes, I'd hate for people to think that this is the only language that this has happened for. It is an area where there has been a lot of written records, and I think that has helped drive a lot of that work and a lot of like local interest from Europeans who are interested in tracing their own languages back. I mean, the Indo-European languages have been written down longer than some languages, not as long as others. I think, you know, you could go pretty far back with Semitic languages too, I expect, because they've been written down for a long time. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I find really interesting is so... Proto-Algonquian, which is the ancestor language of the Algonquian languages, which are spoken in sort of a large portion of Canada, especially, you know, not, not in the north, but a large portion from kind of British Columbia all the way to Nova Scotia and the Maritimes uh, on, on the east, and into the sort of northeastern United States in New England. So there's about 30 Algonquian languages, and Proto-Algonquian is a really well-attested, well-reconstructed uh, language family that is the ancestor language from which these languages are descended. So the estimates that it was probably spoken around 2,000 to 3,000 years ago, and mm -hmm. like with the sort of, you know, apple, apple example, like, it's very clear at a certain level to speakers that, like, these languages are similar and that these languages feel like cousins. And if you get some speakers of different Algonquian language in a room together, and I've been to the Algonquian conference uh, when I was in grad school and you had uh, different speakers and different linguists who had researched these languages. And sometimes they just sit around being like, what's your word for this? Oh, yeah, we have that. Uh, and it can be really fun. Okay, so no one is, like, surprised by Proto-Algonquian as a concept. No one is surprised by Proto-Algonquian as a concept. And I noticed when researching for this episode that there had actually been a linguist who had noticed this connection 10 years before one of the early famous speeches about Indo-European. So even if you want, like, you know, European intellectual tradition bragging rights, which are their own <laughs> sort of thing and is definitely not where all knowledge comes from, yeah. but even if you want to participate in that tradition, this language family has been talked about for a long time. Cool. Okay, so I, I should probably mention a few of the names of the languages in Algonquian, because many of them are, are languages people have probably heard of. So Ojibwe, Cree, Massachusetts, uh, Menominee, Wampanoag, Blackfoot, Mi'kmaq, Innu. Uh, there are a whole bunch of languages that are, are in this family. And a lot of words from them have been borrowed into English at this point. So a lot of words for concepts that English speakers encountered in North America, things like moose, chipmunk, mm -hmm. moccasin, hickory, caribou, raccoon, skunk, succotash, toboggan, woodchuck. Uh, some of these were reshaped on the model of more English-looking words, like woodchuck was reshaped, but a lot of words for, you know, animals and, and concepts in North America were ultimately borrowed from an Algonquian language. That's really cool. I assume that place names are probably also somewhere this pops up a lot as well. Yeah, tons of place names, uh, you know, Ottawa, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Yeah, I mean, and there are other indigenous languages spoken in this area. So like the Iroquoian language are also spoken in this area and they're not related. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, they were some of the first languages that European settlers had contact with. And so a lot of their words for things in the North American continent became the English words for the items as well. Right. Yeah. Once you have a word for raccoon, you can take that word with you across the country. Right. And 
What's also really interesting is that these languages had sort of structural and grammatical similarities as well. well that's cool because so far we've only talked about doing historical work by comparing words and sounds and working backwards from them. But of course, we also have grammar, and grammar between closely related languages can be very similar and tends to be more similar if you've learnt a language close to English, or you've learnt English from the basis of speaking another Germanic language, and then learnt a grammar of a very different language family, uh, I think that's probably something you've encountered before. <laughs> yeah. So Indo-European languages, for example, often have a grammatical a gender distinction between masculine, feminine, and neuter, and some of them have collapsed some of those genders into just masculine and feminine, or neuter and common, with common is the collapsed masculine plus feminine gender. Mm-hmm. Or, or in some cases, like English, they've only retained kind of relics of that on the pronoun system. But Algonquian languages have an animate-inanimate contrast, which is also a sort of way of, of splitting things up. And then they also do particular things with the verb, depending on whether they're dealing with animate nouns or inanimate nouns. So there's there's a lot of ways that that animate-inanimate contrast kind of shows up and goes all the way through the grammar. Right. So a bit like with sounds, we look for that systematic change. With the grammar, we can look at systematic ways that it pops up across each individual language and then compare them to see if we can find commonalities. Right. And sometimes reconstructing sounds can help us find bits of grammar. So if we can reconstruct, you know, one of the ways where animate versus inanimate shows up in Algonquian languages is that the way of making them plural is different. Right. And so if we can reconstruct a plural suffix for the animate nouns and we can reconstruct a plural suffix for the inanimate ones, then that must mean that they had this distinction between the two suffixes, because otherwise they wouldn't both exist and they wouldn't exist in all the daughter languages. And this is one of the fun things about historical linguistics is that it lets you dabble in all the different parts. You have to know a little bit about how sounds might work and change and uh, how grammatical structures work and how they might change across languages as well. So you get to kind of look at all the different parts of how language works. Yeah. And like, you know, so Indo-European languages in general don't distinguish between inclusive and exclusive we. So, you know, mm -hmm. you and me, we're going to go to the movies versus, you know, me and this other person, we're going to go to the movies and we're leaving you behind. Oh, okay. <laughs> but at least I know. At least I'm not waiting for <laughs> my invitation over here. <laughs> at least you know you're not, you're not waiting. Um, and the Algonquian languages all do make this distinction. And that's something you can kind of reconstruct because uh, all these related languages make it, whereas the Indo-European languages, none of them make this distinction. So this is the kinds of like fine-grained grammatical stuff that can last for thousands of years that this distinction sticks around or it doesn't. So great. There's this really great website, the Algonquian Linguistic Atlas, that has audio files of speakers saying various words and phrases in different Algonquian languages, and they're kind of mapped around and you can click on sound files and hear uh, what they sound like and how they're written in various different areas. We'll link to that. In Australia, you also have this one language family reconstructed that has a really large geographic spread, and that's known as the Palmanjungan language family, which is made up of the Palma languages, which is like a subgroup, and the Nyungan ones, but they're just talked about together as a single group. And in fact, it's such a large group, it's around 300 languages, we think, that the dozen or so other language families that sit across the top of Australia are all just known together as the non Parmanungan languages. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Even okay. though they're not related to each other, they're just lumped into being not this major language family. I feel like maybe I should clarify that the Algonquian language family is definitely not the only language family in North America. It's a very big one, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of languages, especially on the West Coast, that are in smaller groups and in towards the South into the US. There are various other groups as well. So it's not quite as cohesive as the Australian picture. Yeah, the Australian, like it's very diverse up the top of Australia, and there's a lot of diversity within this Parmanungan language family, uh, but it definitely dominates in terms of the number of languages in Australia. And, um, one thing that I, you know, obviously don't just find upsetting because of its relevance to historical linguistics, but you're really working with fragmented records in Australia in a way that is obviously because of a direct and traumatic experience of colonization where, you know, you had a 
an incredibly rich oral tradition and you still have an incredibly rich oral tradition across millennia and oral traditions have incredible ways of conveying rich time depth of information it's just a very different experience to the written traditions we're used to with things like latin and old english but it means that when those channels of passing on knowledge and passing on language were lost we really lost this ability to tell the full story of australia and a lot of the work that's done is done with very fragmentary records of word lists or sometimes just a couple of words we know maybe a few key words in a particular language so when i read about historical linguistics in australia i'm always just left with this really heavy-hearted feeling about the the stories that we've lost in being able to tell this big time depth story yeah that's it's huge and so because we have these really fragmentary lists of data a lot of what we can say for certain about similarities and that things that make up proto parmen jungen language is around the the sounds that are in the language so like many of the parmen jungen languages spoken today it was a language without fricatives so it doesn't have sounds like s or z that we take for granted in a lot of the other language families in the world and can make it very striking as a language family oh interesting and it had three vowels which again is definitely on the smaller side for human languages which three vowels or is that not agreed on uh an e r and u and the cool thing is when you have fewer vowels you do more interesting things with the vowel space all right so yeah cuz like when i was learning arabic which also only has three vowels like a lot of things that you might think of as different vowels in english are considered just like versions of the same vowel in arabic yeah it's really neat I think I noticed when I was visiting Australia that a lot of the place names that were based on local languages had ng sounds in them. Is that something that's true of Parmen Jungen? Yes, the velar nasal gets a lot of use and it's in Proto Parmen Jungen as well. Although when it occurs at the start of a word, we often have changed that so it's easier for English speakers to pronounce. Ah uh, yes, uh, that that old story. I mean there are some languages in North America that were wiped out very early and we don't have a lot of records. One of them is Beothuk which was spoken in Newfoundland. Uh we know that but we don't know very much about the language of the speakers in general and it's not even clear whether it was Proto-Algonquian or not, whether it was its own language family. Another one Wampanoag has relatively recently been part of a pretty successful language revitalization movement because they did leave written records uh quite a lot of them and so speakers were able to bring the language of their ancestors back. But yeah, like overall a lot of the Algonquian languages still have at least some speakers around and many of them have revitalization movements and these kinds of things because there is there is still sufficient language transmission happening or being very actively <laughs> worked on to continue happening in a lot of these areas it takes it takes effort but it's not down to the situation where you only have a couple word lists sometimes when you see these very neat historical uh trees we kind of much like animal evolution trees people will draw these trees of the evolution of languages like proto-indo-european as they split off into all the language families and then the languages we know today and sometimes i feel like you can get so into paying attention to words in tables and sound comparisons you can kind of forget that there's a a big story of human history that happens across thousands and thousands of years when you're doing historical linguistics Yeah, and that languages, you know, have this history, but a lot of this history, I think to get back to this question of what can we even know, is related to other types of activities that happen in the world, whether that's conquest or war or people moving from one area to another, and those histories also show up in what we can know about language. So far we've talked about sounds, we've talked about grammar, uh, but we can also look at which words you end up being able to reconstruct all the way through to the proto language and you know the word for mobile phone we're not going to be able to reconstruct back to old english uh even if we have oh, no, records really? or not <laughs> <laughs> the words that we can reconstruct can tell us potentially something about what people were talking about back in a, a language before we have written records of it Right so the idea being that like if these languages all had a common ancestor word for fish or something we know that people must have had fish because otherwise they wouldn't have had a word for it. 
Yes. And there's been a lot of work on Proto-Indo-European for this, just because there's been a lot of work on Proto-Indo-European and there's a lot of data for it. And so we know, for example, that words that we can reconstruct all the way back include domestic animals like cow, sheep, goats, and pigs, and words for dairy foods like milk, and words for wool. So that gives you an idea of the kind of agriculture they were performing. A kind of level of technology. Well, yeah, we can reconstruct a word for wagon, and there's an indication that they had access to the technology of the wheel. That's that's some technology right there. <laughs> yeah. Some exciting technology back there. Uh, yeah, and there are a couple hypotheses about where this means that Proto-Indo-European was spoken. I think a lot of people these days think that it was spoken in the kind of steppe, the Pontic Caspian steppes zone in Eastern Europe. So that's around present Ukraine and Southern Russia. There's also a hypothesis that it was spoken in Anatolia, which is pretty much modern day Turkey. And so, you know, somewhere kind of in that general direction, but there's still, you know, people doing archaeological research uh, and various kinds of research to try to figure out exactly where. But, you know, one thing you can do is say, we're, we're quite sure that it wasn't spoken on an ocean because there isn't a Proto-Indo-European word for ocean, but there was for other smaller bodies of water. So they had access to some water, but not the big one. Um, and so you can kind of figure out things like that. And the same thing, so for Proto-Algonquian, people think that it was spoken somewhere, I think the recent research has suggested that it's spoken kind of immediately west of Lake Superior, based on looking at kind of mm -hmm. the names of plants and animals that are across the different Algonquian languages. Those are found in that particular area. Once again, you have to add some knowledge of semantics and then some like botany and agriculture to your list of things you need to know about when figuring out proto languages. Okay, my, my favorite recent example of this is that like a lot of people have been very excited these days about the fact that many European languages use a verb that's kind of like to hamster to mean to hoard. Mm -hmm. Like German has hamsterin, Dutch has something very similar, uh, and like there's a bunch of different languages. I think some Slavic languages have it. And so people were like, why doesn't English have this great word to hamster? And I was asking this on Twitter the other day, and somebody pointed out to me that the range of the European wild hamster doesn't extend into Britain. It's only on the European continent. That is excellent. Maybe we have a hypothesis there about the extent of uh, linguistic and hamster spreads. Well, English does have the word to squirrel, <laughs> which means something quite similar, you know, because we do have squirrels in English speaking areas uh, more than we used to have hamsters. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, no claims about Proto Indo European there, but it's sort of an interesting example of how geography and climate and animals and plants and, you know, botany and so on, the flora and fauna can influence what we know about languages as well. We've talked about three different proto groups. We haven't even talked about isolate languages for which you can't find any related languages to do any comparison. But there are a whole bunch of other language families that have been constructed and reconstructed back to proto forms. I work on Tibetan languages, which are, depending on how far back you're willing to make educated conjectures, are either part of the Tibeto Burman family which includes languages of Tibet and the languages of Burma and that whole region. But some people claim we can reconstruct even further back to include the Sinosphere, so the languages of China, which would be a much larger and older group. So that's another a, a part of the world that I work in directly in terms of proto-language reconstruction. Another proto-language that I'm just a, kind of a huge fan of um, is proto-Bantu. Mm, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I studied a, a very, very small amount of, of Kinyarwanda when I was an undergrad. And ever since then, I've been like, Bantu languages, they're great. Um, and uh, so, you know, and proto-Bantu is really neat because, you know, one of the things that a lot of people know about the Bantu languages is that they have all of these noun classes. And it turns out, like, yeah, you can reconstruct all of these noun classes. And of course, there's controversy about exactly how many can be reconstructed to proto-Bantu. But a lot of the kind of, you know, there are certain set that are very well established. And then there's another area where there's more controversy. And we can also reconstruct, you know, where people lived and sort of what technology they had. So agriculture, fishing, and the use of boats based on the vocabulary, were already known to the Bantu people before they started expanding into different areas and the languages started diverging. Mm. But ironworking was something that 
showed up later once they'd already expanded. So you can kind of place the date of expansion between 3000 and 800 BCE. And it's just Amazing. Like, these kinds of things you can know about these people so long ago. It's really neat. But Gretchen, if we wanted to get to Proto World, we would have to take all of these Proto families that people have spent centuries now meticulously working back to these incredibly tentative hypotheses about how these languages work, and you would have to go back even further to get to Proto World. How does grown up Gretchen feel about 13 year old Gretchen's aspirations? Well, so I went back, I actually, because I still have this book, uh, and I went back and I looked at it again for the first time in many, many years. <laughs> oh my gosh, amazing. What was it like to revisit? Ah, uh, I mean, fortunately, the chapter was only nine pages long, so there was only like so much damage <laughs> they could do in nine pages. Oh, I'm no. not naming the book. Like, <laughs> it was it was a great book for getting a twelve year old interested in linguistics. Uh, it served its purpose. I, I, I haven't read anything else of it in many years, but uh, you know, it was very willing to be very credulous about uh, a lot of these statements. And one of the things that I noticed is that. You know, so we're able to go back, you know, a couple thousand years by comparing what we have of existent languages or sometimes records of languages from a few hundred years ago or maybe a thousand, two thousand years ago. You can go back an additional kind of hop step of maybe two to three thousand years. And that's kind of where we can go. And the problem is time depth wise. It's not just like, okay, well, what if we take each of these languages and compare them? That only takes us back, even if we could do all of this methodology, which, you know, we can't always. That only takes us back another potential hop step of another couple thousand years. Well, we need to go back like a hundred thousand years. So we need to do this step like 50 times. And we're already in incredibly tenuous ground. And we just don't have data at that point. <laughs> like maybe 50 times, maybe 70 or 80 times, because we also don't know how far we have to go back because speech and sign doesn't leave fossils. So not only do we not know how far we have to go back, you know, we start multiplying very approximate numbers by each other, and then we just keep doing so, and the inaccuracies just keep compounding. So I'm glad that this book got me into linguistics, but I'm also glad to leave it sort of safely on the shelf as a memento. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. Mixy on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Have you listened to all of the Lingthusiasm episodes and wish there were more? You can get access to 40 bonus episodes right now to listen to at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and other rewards like helping to keep the show ad-free for everyone. Recent bonus topics include synesthesia, numbers, and linguistics with kids. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!